then I'm happy to introduce our speaker today who needs no introduction because <laughs> I'm very happy to say she's been sitting in the front row through the whole semester. Amber Hines, as you know, actually is a web developer, something I am not. In fact, I've recently tried to say she's a WordPress developer because that's the phrasing I'm seeing. She's active in various organizations, including she's one of the organizers of the WordPress meetup. Realize that if you make your living in this business, you look for support. There are very active groups. Amber's part of that. She is also part of, and let's see if I can get this right, Allied Women Entrepreneurs is a different organization. When you do go out in the professional world, um, <laughs> networking, you want to support network anyway. Why I'm so happy to have her here and it's so obvious in Wednesday's lecture, I don't use WordPress. I don't know how it works. Um, all I knew how to do was to teach you how to install it. So from this point forward, Amber is going to do a, a terribly difficult task. In 45 minutes, she's <laughs> going to try to give you a feel for something that could easily be its own semester course, which is just how does one really produce great websites with WordPress. There you go, Amber. Thank you. So, yes, 45 minutes is kind of hard, <laughs> but we're going to see what we can cram in. I did want to touch a little bit. I know that Professor Beveridge did talk a little bit about why people use CMSs or why people use WordPress. And I was, when I was talking to him about it, I told him a story about the first couple websites I built or worked on were just PHP sites without a content management system. And I happened to live on Nantucket, which is this beautiful island off the Cape of Massachusetts. And I realized I didn't really like it when people called me in the middle of the day. And they were like, can you change this word or this picture? So I started looking for CMSs, and I started to look into WordPress. And so the number one reason why I started looking into it is because copying and pasting is boring. So I like the coding stuff. I like the strategy and the how do you market and how do you do SEO and how do you build awesome things. I kind of really hate when someone emails me their crap and asks me to paste it into a website. So that's why, right? Um, Lots of resources for learning. So when I was looking, there are tons of books and websites and blogs and people sharing code snippets and all kinds of things. So that's really useful since I didn't have the opportunity to. My undergrad degree is in philosophy, not in anything tech related at all. So it's very useful. Um, it's open source, which is good. It can also be bad if you're trying to make a living in it because the requirement if you use, open, if you use WordPress is that everything you make has to have a GPL license meaning that it can be taken and modified by anyone. Um, so you have to weigh that if you are OK with being in an open source platform. I feel like it's, it benefits me because I learn from other people's code and I can take and modify other people's. So I'm fine with people doing the same with mine, that sort of thing. Um, and it has, as we were just talking about, a large collaborative community. There's WordPress meetups. They also have WordCamps, which um, the WordPress Foundation, which is a nonprofit, help support, so they literally are not allowed to charge anyone more than $20 per day for this conference, which is huge because there are other conferences that you could pay thousands of dollars a day just to go to. Um, so there's a lot of ways to learn and connect and meet with people face-to-face -face and learn more. Um, so what is a WordPress developer? You think of it as building websites, but it also could be more than that. So people that are WordPress developers may not actually work on websites. They may literally build and sell commercial software products, like a theme or a plugin, which we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, and so they're dealing with customers that are buying their software. Um, and there are also growing, increasingly, businesses that sell WordPress software as service, where they actually have customers that are using it on their platform sort of thing. Um, then you have WordPress developers who work in-house on a single WordPress website for that business. And then you have people like me who build and or modify WordPress websites for clients, um, which means we work on a variety of websites. And that's mainly what I'm going to talk about today. So being a WordPress developer is a combination of coding things from scratch, modifying other people's code, and clicking buttons in a CMS. <laughs> So there are some parts of it that you still have to do the front end user stuff, because if you don't set it up that way, then your user who's going to end up using the website that you've developed won't be able to modify or change those things. So everything I do when I'm deciding what am I going to code and what do I need to make 
possible for an end user to modify down the line. I always have to keep that in mind. Um, so modifying WordPress, I wanted to talk a little bit about the core files. Let me do a little split screen thing here. This might be useful. Is that still big enough or should I make it full screen? Can we see the, yeah? Okay, cool. So when you install WordPress, this is my clean install that I haven't really added too much to. This is what you get. The WP admin file contains all, or directory contains all of the different files that control the back end, the content management portion of WordPress. Um, so you can see you have CSS, but it's specific to the back end, the admin CSS that the user sees when they're in the dashboard, um, and all of these sorts of things that manage that. And then if we go into the WP includes, you'll see you again, you have these things. And this controls the front end rendering of the website. Um, and then you have some other sort of things that like PHP mail, this is what controls all of the emails that the website sends. For example, those password reset emails, um, when you get comments and it notifies you of the comments, this is controlled by the, the PHP mail or the WP mail that PHP, which uses the sort of general PHP mailing that's set up on your server. Um, and, and there's, you know, different things in here. So what is important is to sort of look through them and get familiar with them because you need to be aware of what's there. But you don't change it, like ever. <laughs> because WordPress updates, and you want WordPress to update because it is a continually, um, it's, Contributors are adding to it all the time. They fix bugs, they give you new features. Uh, if you don't update, you are very likely to get hacked. It is a serious problem. The only p clients I've ever had that got hacked were literally, I built their website, I taught them how to maintain it, I explained about updating, and then they contact me two years later, oh yeah, I never logged into the website again. <laughs> Well, that's why you got hacked, because there were some sort of security vulnerability or something that could be taken advantage of, and because they didn't update, they weren't getting the patches to fix it. Um, so when you look at the core files, you, can't, you need to know what's there, but if you want to modify some functionality, you can't do it in what's called those core WordPress files, um, because every time you update, these files get overwritten, and you will lose your content. So when WordPress updates, your safe zone is your HT access file, which on a really basic WordPress install looks like this. It basically tells it we're going to use WordPress. Um, I can, hold on, that might be a little better. And it's, it's basically telling it look for index.php and getting some stuff within that. I think, did you show index last time? I can't remember if that was the one you showed. I've um, never shown rewrite rules. Oh. oh, yeah. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so this is your basic HD access, but you can modify this and it won't get overwritten. So, for example, I have um, a couple of clients that have sites that, have, that are 100% HT password protected. And so I added that into the HD access file and it's totally fine. You update it and it will not get, um, it will not get overwritten. Another safe zone file is our WP config file, which looks like this. And let me zoom out a little. So this is sort of what controls your base configurations for WordPress. You have right here is this is what connects your website to your database. So when we looked at on Wednesday that it runs you through this thing and says, hey, you don't have a database. Give me a name. It's because this file this information right here was empty. So when you put it in, it adds it in here, and this is how it knows what to access WordPress with. Um, it has all of the salts that it uses in this file as well. Um, and your table prefix, when we look at the database in a minute, you'll see that everything is prefixed with this. By default, it's WP. You may see as you start to work on in some hosts, if you use their one-click installer just on the server, that they're starting now to prefix them with random characters because it's more of a security, right? If you don't know what it's prefixed with, it's harder to hack. Um, so by default, it does this, but you can change it. 
you just have to make sure if you change it in your w, WP config that you go in your database and change all those table prefixes there too. Otherwise, they won't be able to find each other, right? Um, what is very useful as well is this debugging mode. So by default, this is set to false. If you put it in true, it will then give you all these awesome errors as you're coding up right on the top of both either your admin side, if that's where you're working, or the front end to help you figure out where your bugs are or what's going wrong. Um, so I always set this to true whenever I'm working on a website, and then you just have to make sure you turn it off because there will be some plugins, even some, for example, I was looking at the other day, um, the WordPress importer plugin, which allows you to take an XML file from one WordPress site to another WordPress site, and that's sort of put out there by the WordPress community. Well, I noticed that it had a bajillion debug errors. <laughs> so there are like legitimate plugins that function just fine, but they will throw debug errors. So you want to make sure it's turned set to false before you go live. Yeah. So if it's throwing debug errors, doesn't that mean that um, it's potentially insecure and you probably can use it, or is that not okay? It's not. It's not always that it's insecure. It could just be that something doesn't function exactly the way it should, but it might not be a security issue. Um, or it could be that it, like that one has a bunch of things saying this is deprecated and it's still being used, but that, that plugin, it's not as big of a deal because it's like, well, you install it, you import your XML file, you never need to use that plugin ever again. So it does its job and then you can uninstall it, which is probably why they haven't made an effort to really fix that. <laughs> Other ones, it could be that the, yeah, there are security issues and the developer, because plugins can come from anywhere in WordPress and any person can just say, hey, here's this cool plugin and I put it up and you can get it for free off wordpress.org and you can use it and you have no idea about the quality of their code. Um, so it could be that it's a problem or it could just be, it's not really a problem, but you just want to make sure that your like site users are not seeing that because then it makes the website look bad. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and then we can see that here we're also defining the um, directory path as well. So you can use in WordPress some, some, short, some shortcuts when you're writing themes or plugins where you can just say plugin underscore dir path and it, or um, you know, site, that sort of thing so that you don't have to type in the entire file path the entire time. And this is part of where it pulls from. So this file will never be overwritten when you update because obviously you would lose your database if your thing got overwritten. Um, so the other safe zone then is anything that is inside this WP content directory. So inside here is where our plugins live, our themes live, and our uploads, which is it organizes it by year and month. And this is basically where all of your files, if you upload, right, an mp3, or if you upload a PDF, or if you upload images. You'll notice this is the same image, and it is created in different sizes. So this is the full size, and then this is a 150 by 150, which is thumbnail size in WordPress, and this is a 300 by 225, which happens to be what this website's medium is set to. Um, so one of the nice things about WordPress when you upload files is that it automatically creates all these different sizes for you because a lot of users don't understand. I can't upload this picture I just took off my camera because it's 6,000 pixels, right? So WordPress will create smaller images automatically for them and then they can choose one of those smaller images to use or you can set a smaller image size when you're hard coding into your theme or your plugin that it will use that size. Um, and it helps with obviously load time and that sort of stuff. Um, and then this upgrade folder, we were talking about that yesterday. I'll be honest, I have no idea what this upgrade folder does. It's always there. There's nothing in it. My belief is that in the process of upgrading, it temporarily dumps things into this file, and then it deletes it when it's done. But I don't actually know. I suppose we could Google it. <laughs> that's generally what I do, but I've never had to, like, find out, so that's what it does. And we'll come back to the themes and plugins here in just a minute. Let's see, so, so we can go back here. Um, also, any files, if you stick them in your root, if you just add something else, it won't overwrite that. 
Um, it will overwrite stuff, though, if, you, if you're like, I'm just going to put this in WP includes or WP admin, it will overwrite that and delete it when you update. Because it's like, oh, this isn't supposed to be here. I don't know what this is. And it'll delete it. But if it's in your root, it's safe. Um, so largely then, what we were talking about then, if you are a WordPress developer, what you do is you build themes or you build plugins or you build both. Um, in what I do, I build both. And that is because themes are supposed to control style and plugins control functionality of the website. Um, so you notice I have a little parentheses there. Best practice, not always reality. If you were to go to ThemeForest and look at the themes there, and a WordPress developer who builds sites, like custom sites for clients, there's a whole rant that we could do about that. But a lot of them are like, hey, my theme has a slider built into it. My theme has, oh, oh, this theme is specifically for bloggers who write about foods. It has a special section for you to add recipes. And it's built into the theme, which is cool if you are only going to use that theme. And then, let's say one day you're like, ah, oh, this theme sucks. I want something that looks better. And you uninstall it, you activate a new theme, and you realize, oh my gosh, all the images I had in my slider are gone. I can't find them. My recipes that I you know, have been writing for the past two years, I have no way of accessing them. They're not gone. They're still in the database. But the functionality that was getting them out of the database was in the theme. And therefore, when you uninstall that theme, you lose the ability to access that content as a user. So don't, that's so bad. <laughs> but people do it because there are, one, there are users who don't know and don't understand. And then it sort of forces them to be stuck in a product. And two, building themes and trying to sell them commercially is sort of a competitive market. And it's hard not to, you want to be like, I'm an all-in-one package, and you pay me this money, and look, you don't have to install all these extra things. And so for a user who doesn't understand the long-term implications of that, it looks better. And so some theme developers do it because they think they'll get more sales. But it's not, it is not good practice. And so... Really, everything you do that adds any sort of functionality to your site should be built into a plugin or added in a plugin if you're not building that specific plugin yourself. And that way, when you decide you want to change the design of the site, you won't lose access or lose functionality. So this is just some other things to know before we get into like themes and plugins. So we kind of talked a little bit about looking at it. So posts and pages, we saw that on the back end. Um, posts are basically blog posts, which is content that can be related to one another by the default in WordPress is categories or tags, um, but that's what we call taxonomies. And you can create your own taxonomies as well for organizing things, but the other big way that they're organized is that they have a relationship to one another by date. So you notice by default in WordPress, it shows the most recent post, and then you can view what's called a loop of them, so all of them on one page or a certain number of them on one page before they pa paginate and you have to go to another page. And they're related to each other or organized by date in default. Um, pages, on the other hand, are what would be considered standalone content that may have a hierarchical relationship to one another. So one page could be a parent of another, um, or they might not be related to each other at all. And typically, these are more static. It's something you're not changing too often, like your about page. Um, and if you do change it, you're kind of like, ah, I don't really care what it used to say, so I don't, I'm not worried about preserving a record of it on the web, and therefore I'm just going to delete it and rewrite that content, and I'm good. Um, but, <laughs> so we're going to look in a database right now. They're actually kind of all the same thing. So I use this cool tool called Desktop Server, which is um, alternative to like Man for Wimp. So, but it's specifically for WordPress, and one of the things that's really awesome about it, besides the fact that my local host looks like this, and I have quick shortcuts to view everything, is that when I add a new site, it automatically downloads WordPress and all of that for me. And I also have the ability to, I have a blueprint that I set up that has all the plugins I like pre-configured and my base theme that I start building off of every time, so that I can just say, actually build it from this blueprint, and it gives me like a huge head start. So it's cool tool to check out. If you become a WordPress developer, if you're doing other development in addition, you could use it for that, but it may not be 
best suited if you're like, eh, I'm, I'm only doing a few WordPress websites. But anyway, so this is what a database looks like for a clean, like I haven't installed a bunch of other plugins or things that have added tables, okay? So everything content-wise, like the main parts of content are stored in this WP posts table. And let me do that. So this is obviously PHP my admin for looking at MySQL. And what we can see right here is hello world is the title of this post. Here's what the content looks like. If we click on it, of course, we'd be able to see the entire content. It is published. You can make comments on it. Pings is related to, um, there's something set up in WordPress where other WordPress blogs can attempt to notify one another if something's been linked to it. So if I link to your blog, then your blog, if you say, I want to show this, then it, in the comment section, it would show a little link saying, oh, this blog post of mine was written about on Amber's site, something like that. Um, I don't see that being used so much anymore, but a lot of people were using it. Um, and then if it were, you can individually password protect posts or pages. So if you wanted to do that, there would be something here. And then we can sort of see the post name. This is actually what the URL end is in there. Um, when it was modified, when it was published. And then once we get over here, we see this post type. So this is a post, meaning it's a blog post. And we can see right below it, there's another one that is a page. Also stored in here, oh, I don't have very many, that's right, uh, is would be if you had media, your images are kept in that directory, but it creates a row in this table, and that's how it knows that in this file, this is the media and this is the file it relates to, and it would say attachment under that. Um, and then we have one other table that stores information, which is, oh wait, let's just go back this way, uh, WP Post Meta, and this stores there's not a lot here because obviously this is my clean one that I use that's not super modified. Um, but this would store information like if you wanted to add to the bottom of every post like uh, the weather today. And you just have this little area where it just says the weather today. And, and uh, every time you write a blog post you could say sunny, rainy, or whatever you want. That's sort of like an extra detail that repeats as a field that you can enter on your blog posts. Um, so it would store it here, and it would relate to it with this post ID. So number two, obviously, was that page we were looking at. So you can see here, there's a meta key, which is what page template are you using? And the meta value is, I'm using the default page template. Um, and this other one relates to the blog post. And at this moment, I'm not entirely sure what the edit lock is. Um, but you can add that. So. So extra details about content is stored in WP Post Meta and it's linked by the post ID. So one of the really cool things and something that I do a lot and I would say is probably one of the most common modifications that you see is that you can create custom post types, which is a separate way or a better way of organizing content, um, which we sort of talked about a little bit like the recipe website that wants recipes in its own special section. Um, so those are some other examples. And we're going to have links to this, but all of these things are links to, I have tons of links in here. Uh, WordPress has a codex, which is super useful if you want to learn different things. Um, this page also tells you if you want to add a um, custom post type in a plugin, please do it in a plugin, not a theme. <laughs> this is the code that you would need in order to create one. So this is an example for products. So we are registering the post type and we have to give it sort of a name that a server can use, right? And then it takes labels. So what is the plural name and what is the singular name? And in this case, they said products or product. Um, public means can it be visible on the front end of the website? Because there are some times when you set up post types that you want to use for an internal purpose, but they're not going to be visible as an actual page on the website. Um, and has archive relates to whether or not they have 
a default page like that blog post page where you can see all the blog posts and before you click and go into one. So that's the archive. And then when you click and go into one, it's a single page or a single post. So that's what that relates to. And there's a ton more attributes and those sorts of things. Uh, if we go way down here, maybe. Uh, there's a link further on. And we won't spend time looking at that specifically because we don't have time for it. But so throughout my talk, and I'm not going to go into all of them, there are all these links that you'll be able to go out and find that information on how do I make this or what is this thing. Um, so other things that are useful to know widgets are basically mini programs or tools that can be added to different areas on your website. So if we go visit this website, sorry, I should have opened this ahead of time. Um, maybe. The internet does not decide to do that. There we go. All right, so widgets are found if you go to appearance, maybe. There we go. Widgets, so they're the third option down. And all of my available widgets are located here. And then I have a widget area. Widget areas are created by your theme. So a theme says, I'm adding areas that people can add content to. So this allows users to, to easily display things without having to know how to code. So this is a recent post widget. If we were to look at this site on the front end, then we could see something like, hey, here's my recent post. And it displays hello world, because this is where that widget area is showing up. Um, so these are sort of a nice interface for users in that they're drag and drop. Um, so the widget area is created by your theme, because it's the look, right, where you can put things. The actual widgets themselves, some of them are core. So for example, the recent posts, all of the, actually most of these things that you're seeing, because I don't think this has any plugins in it. Yeah. So every single one of these, like it, add an RSS feed, display your recent comments, these come built into WordPress. Other widgets might come from a theme, if it's theme specific, and other widgets come from plugins. So building widgets is something that a lot of times you might do if you want to be able to give users some more control without requiring them to know some code over things. Um, and it's OK to put widgets into a theme in a way that you wouldn't necessarily put some other functionality into a theme. Uh, let's see. So, so I have links there if you want to check that out. The about widgets is kind of more like the user base. And then the API is the actual, if you want to develop it, how does that work? So short codes. Short codes are a way of adding code fragments into the body of a post or a page. So what that looks like on the back end of a website, I guess you can't super see that, which is sort of a bummer, um, is it's in a square bracket. I suppose I could go there. Mm, might take too long. If we have time, I'll go into one. But it's basically, it puts it in a square bracket. And it can have just, so this one says gravity form. Actually, you know what? I will go. So here's the front end of this page. It's a contact page, and it has a form on it. In between the content, there's content above and below. So if we were to log into this site, so you can do cool stuff like I brand the dashboards for my clients. So when they go there, they don't see a WordPress logo. They see their logo. Sort of cool, fun thing to do. So here's another quick example. Events. On a normal WordPress website, you wouldn't see that. So this is a custom post type that is set up for this person to display their events. And it came from a plugin that I did not build. So there's something that you always you know, want to think about is that you can use other people's plugins, and it saves you a lot of time and also makes it easier for you to make think functionality available to your clients so you maybe don't know how to build all of it or that you don't, it would be too cost prohibitive for them to pay you to build that. Um, so what we're looking at as well, and you can see this forms, is the same sort of thing. That is a plugin that I use all the time because if I were to build a custom form, it would not really be worth it. So what we're looking at on the back end here is this. And 
and I said. So it is in square brackets. This part right here is the actual short code. It's just gravity form, which is saying display a gravity form. And the short code is coded into that plugin so that it knows what to do. And then short, um, short codes can also take attributes. So this is the ID of the specific form I want to show. And then you can obviously see the different things written out here as well. Um, so that's what it looks like on the back end. These are hit or miss because sometimes if you're actually building for a user, they understand that. Other times it's confusing. What's nice is that you can build in ways. So for example, this has an add form button. And it gives them a way of, this is a live website, but if you edit things on a page and you don't hit update, it won't show up. But it gives you a way of, as a user, adding in a short code. Where did I put it? So do you see it just added another one for me without me having to know and type it? So that's sort of a nice thing for a user. But you have to build that interface. If you don't build that interface, you just tell them, the short code for this is gravity form. And these are all the attributes you can use. And they have to know, they have to either look at your documentation or know that and then type it in themselves. So uh, let's see. So theme development, as I fly through this. So themes live in, let's see, we're going to go back to this. They live in WP content slash themes, which is right here. And this one happens to have two themes installed. So a theme, what's important to know is it's more than just a skin. Like you might think of, you know, oh, you can just skin things and adjust the style. So I know I kept saying it doesn't do functionality, but it does because it controls what comes out of the database and what displays. So if you don't have a theme, like if you were to say, I'm just going to delete all these themes, like your website literally, the front end of your website would not function. You'd have a white screen. There would be nothing there if you were to try and go. Um, so themes control the look of the website, but they also pull content out of the database. Themes can be either standalone and static, which means they were built once, they only relate to themselves, and they never update ever. Um, or they can be part of a framework, which means there, there is this, this theme. So I build with the Genesis theme, Genesis framework, which adds a lot of theme functionality. And then I can build a child theme, which adopts many styles from the parent. And then I only have to modify what I want to modify or add in what I want to add in. And it changes what belongs to the parent. But if I don't change anything, then it just pulls from the parent. So using a, a theme framework is nice if you find one that you like because it can save you some time. If there's core stuff that you know, like, I want to have the ability. So like with Genesis, it has already built into it. Either I could have full width content, or I could have content sidebar, or sidebar content, or sidebar content sidebar. So it already has all those things built into it. And then I can just choose which ones I want to use. And I can adjust the width and the layout and the, how that functions. But the actual thing that there are sidebars and that they're pre-set up is there for me. It also has a different number of menus already set up. So like on the front of your WordPress, if you want menu areas, you would have to code those in if you didn't have them in a theme. So having a framework is a nice place to start. Um, and then it can speed things along from a development perspective. So. I wanted to pull up a different site real quick. And I'm like, let's see. So, so you can see if you look in here, so 2016, that's a default WordPress theme, and that's an example of a standalone. However, the default WordPress themes are not static, they do update. So what's really important is that if you were say, I like 2016, except for I don't like what the footer says, and I want to change what the footer says, um, or I want to change the colors of the links. Even if it's just two things that you're changing, you can't change it in that theme because that theme will request updates from you. And if you update it, just like core, it will overwrite all your changes. So for the same thing, you have to create a child theme if you're to use that. 
So I do mine off of Genesis, is my parent. And this is what my directory looks like for my child theme. So themes contain, at an absolute minimum, a style sheet, which, oh, I hate it that it does this in Notepad and not Slumbo, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but if we look at, hold on, this is going to drive me nuts. Let me go in here. No, no. Uh, all right. So if we look at this, this sort of tells it at the top. WordPress needs some of these things in order to understand. This is a theme, so it has to have a theme name, um, and it needs to have a version number at a minimum. As long as it says a theme name with a name and a version number, then it will know that it's a theme file that you're working on. Um, and then you can add other things in, like a URI to the theme, which is probably only really useful if you're selling them commercially, because you'd put a link to where someone could buy it. Um, and then you can put in descriptions, you can put your author information. So this part right here, template genesis, this is what tells it this is a child theme of another theme. So if you're planning on making something, you have to get that from the other theme. And you would look in that theme's files and you can sort of see what it's using. Typically it matches the directory. Yes? When the parent theme gets updated by whoever's updating it, is mm -hmm. the child theme in here at those updates as well? Like your changes just don't get overwritten? Is that what it is? Yes. So it will inherit the update. So if they add functionality, then it will inherit what they add. So what's really important and is a big discussion in WordPress is backwards compatibility. So if you write a theme and let's say you misspelled sidebar and you added sidebars and you misspelled it and you're all like oh man I'm gonna fix that I'm gonna push an update and you correct it and it's like a function name it will break everyone's child theme who was referring to that function so what's really important if you're developing something that other people might be building off of, especially if you're building plugins, it less so happens with themes, but it does, it could, um, then you have to do things like, oh, I'm gonna add in like the correction, but I also have to have a reference to my incorrect spelling. So it could still cause problems when you update, even if you're in a child. But for the most part, most like people that are pushing out commercially used things or that understand like that's, other people are taking these and building upon them, they, are aware of that. But um, if they added, if they're like, I'm adding this functionality or I'm changing the way this one thing, it will impact. And there are some things like um, WooCommerce is an, an e shopping cart plugin, and that they will say, this is a major update. You need to read everything, prepare for it if there is going to be doing something that might cause issues. Um, so they have the style sheet. And then they have to have a index.php, which I don't have one in my child theme because I'm using one off the parent theme. But basically, that's a template page. So basic, and then, and then they can also have a functions file, which does things like on queuing style sheets or scripts, adding features um, like widget areas, custom image sizes like we were talking about. And then they have the template files, which are the PHP source files that are used to generate pages requested by visitors. So, for example, this theme has this front page, which actually is a widgetized front page, so everything is set up with widgets. But it says, and I'm flying through, but if they have an, you know, if this sidebar, which is a widget area, is active, then you're going to start adding these, this, it's going to add the class. And then it's going to get some JavaScript that we have set up here that controls how some things look, right, using the front page JS. Um, and then if we go down further, you can see that it does some stuff as far as actually getting, um, like, removing the custom loop and doing, or removing the default loop that's from my parent theme and doing a custom loop and that sort of stuff. Um, so that's where your PHP knowledge sort of comes in, is setting up these template files that pull content out and display it for visitors on the site. So 
there's some links here. Underscores is really cool. Go check it out. I don't have time to show it to you, but it's what um, Automatic uses, and it's what all of the 20 whatever themes are based on. And you can go there and enter some basic information about what you want your theme, and it will spit out all of the default templates and everything that you need with a really bare bones style sheet. So then you can go in and modify and set it up. So it's another cool way to start if you don't want to start from a framework. Um, so plugin development. Plugins add functionality or modify the functionality of a WordPress website. And some plugins modify the functionality of other plugins. So like we were talking about, plugins get updates too. So if you're like, I, I like this plugin, but I needed to do some other thing, you can't just modify that plugin unless you never want to update that plugin, which you probably don't want to do. So what you do is you build your own plugin that modifies that other plugin. <laughs> So you kind of stack upon what someone else did. Um, so plugins live in the directory that is WP content slash plugins. They don't have to be, like you'll notice, they don't have to be in their own little directory house, um, which by default when you get, so this one has a bajillion plugins on it, and it doesn't, oh, I deleted it. By default, you'll notice if you look in there, when you first download, you have one that's like Hello Dolly, which is this weird thing where it displays Hello Dolly music lyrics on the back end of your website. I don't know, it came from Matt Mullenweg, one of the core contributors, and it's not in a file. It doesn't have to be, but typically you're gonna have more than one file for your, or it's not in a directory, you're gonna have more than one file for your plugin, so you put it in a directory. Um, and at a minimum, what it needs then is sort of like a functions, or sometimes this has the name. And again, it has to have a plugin name, so this is how we know that it's a plugin, and it needs to have a version number, and then you can add some other information. Oops. Um, so this plugin is super basic. Again, they don't have to be huge. What this does is it allows the user role contributors who cannot normally upload media like images, they could write blog posts, but they can't put images in them, to be able to upload images. So I wrote this, it's out on the repo, like people can, which is wordpress.org. They can download it for free and add it to their website if they want to change that functionality. And basically, it hooks into this Wordmin, or this WordPress action, which is admin init, which fires before anything else happens when the back end of the website is loaded. So before anything else happens, you're loading the dashboard of your website, you're going to use my function. And basically, my function says, contributor is get the role contributor. So you'd have to look at the WordPress um, user's stuff Pay, uh, file to figure out what is this that I'm modifying. And then we are basically adding a capability, which is, again, this is a capability that's defined in core WordPress upload files. So now if this plugin is turned on without the user even having to do anything, it automatically says anyone you have set to contributor can upload files. Um, so that's like a really basic plugin. Some plugins you'll see have tons of things inside them. Um, and mine, just for reference, oh, I went away from it. Um, so the only reason why this has all this other stuff in it is because I put it on WordPress.org, and when you put it on WordPress.org, they have rules about you know, what else you have to have in it. But it literally could have just been that functions file, and that would be it. Um, so tons of resources on plugin development. And tools I like to use, I use Sublime, Desktop Server, Photoshop at sort of the minimum. And then I have a ton of resources. I'm not going to go through them all, but there's stuff from WordPress if you want to learn more about it. There are books that I have found useful, podcasts and stuff I like to listen to, and then some other resources that are, I haven't ever used Linda or Treehouse, but a lot of people I know that develop and have taught themselves to develop have used those because they have WordPress specific development stuff. Um, and seriously, as we've talked about before, you can just Google stuff. Forcon's WordPress Meetup. Next time is Tuesday, May 17th at 6 p.m. And we're talking about building extensible plugins. So we do two a month. One is developer focused, one is user focused. This one is developer focused, so we'll be looking at code. Um, that's it. I was <laughs> like the fastest, sorry. <laughs> Does anybody have anything in the two minutes that are left? Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. I typically use Yoast, um, WordPress SEO, which if you search in the repo, um, it's a free one. They have add-ons if you want, like, WooCommerce extra special things for your e-commerce store, but that's a really great free one. It's also good because it gives you a, a red, yellow, green to tell you how good you're doing, which is useful for users who don't know SEO because it grades their pages. So I think someone else had a question. Yeah. How do you go about getting your clients? Um, I am largely word of mouth. So I have quite a few clients that are repeat. I have a lot that refer because I do good work for them, I guess. I'm also a member of the Chamber of Commerce, so I've gotten clients from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've gotten a few from the WordPress meetup just because I go and I help people for free, and they're like, oh, I want more help than that. And I'm like, well, you can come back to WordPress meetup or, 